our lives are the sum of our choices. And we cannot escape the past. Ethan, this mission of yours is gonna cost you dearly. This week on Talking About the Movies, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to watch me review the latest Tom Cruise action-adventure spectacle, the seventh installment of the long-running series. This is Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, Part 1. Welcome to Talking About the Movies, and today, as we usually do, we take a look at the biggest new release of the weekend, and there's no bigger new release this weekend than Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, the seventh installment of the Mission Impossible series, and the first of a two-part storyline that's going to continue with a second film that is set to come out next year, but considering the actor strike going on and the writer strike, and the fact that they're still filming this film, um... I would be surprised if this gets pushed back a little bit, but before we delve into this new movie, we might as well talk about the other movies in the series. Um, I did a Time About the Movies episode on the first movie, Mission Impossible, which came out in 1996. I liked it. I thought it was alright. I don't think it's as good as Brian De Palma's previous adaptation of a TV series in The Untouchables, but I think that I think there's still a lot there that still is more than worth it. The score by Danny Elfman, the theme song is very good, Tom Cruise is very good in the film. It's clear in that movie that He's the main focus early on in this. Is early on in that series of films, including, the, especially in the first one. Even though you see the other characters in there, including Bing Rhames, who I think is the only other character that's been in all seven of these movies, and um, still has some memorable action sequences, and still a great movie over. So good, fun movie overall. Not a perfect film overall, but it still is a very enjoyable film. Mission Impossible Two, not so much. Mission Impossible Two was the. It came out at the time when Tom Cruise's ego was so high, and that movie was just... They might as well just, just call that movie Mission Impossible 2, Tom Cruise's ego, because the whole movie was basically about him, and the the movie overall was just pretty pretty mediocre. It wasn't exciting. The action sequences weren't that engaging, and, you know, honestly, it wasted a lot of talent in that film. Anthony Hopkins was also in there. Uh, Tandy Newton... Uh, is in that film, Dugray Scott, who actually passed up on Wolverine in the X-Men movie, the Bryan Singer film, to play play the villain in that film, which some might say would be a bad call, especially considering mean, how well Hugh Jackman's career has transpired since then, but um, bottom line, Mission Impossible 2, not a great film, definitely the worst one of the series, but um, it was st for a long time, it was still the most popular film in the series financially. But then the third film comes out, Mission Impossible 3 in 2006, J.J. Abrams comes in to direct it, and um, the series went back on track again. It's slowly but surely they started to put the focus back on the team again. It wasn't in that movie in particular, but it definitely, in my opinion, it's definitely the strongest of the three films so far. Um, Tom Cruise is great, as I think Tom Cruise was great in that film. Michelle Monaghan was really good in there. You have Kerry Russell in there as well. Uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman played a great villain in that film. And um, then we got Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, the Brad Bird directed one, where that one was the full focus on the team. You had Simon Pegg in there, joining uh, Bing, Ra Bing Rames as well as um, uh, Paula Patton in that movie. And um, man, Paula Patton in that movie, like, I always tell, tell people, if you want to look for a movie where somebody looks sexy without having their clothes off whatsoever and they just look great, Ghost Protocol, man. When Paula Patton shows up in that green dress, it's just like... Oh my god, she's she is a beautiful, beautiful woman in that film. And the movie itself is really damn good. Alec Baldwin's also in there too as well. Like it's a really fun film. I really enjoy that one a lot. It's definitely and um it's definitely a really great film. Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, another really great film in the series, bringing in Rebecca Ferguson to join the team. And um each of these movies get better and better. The, th the thing about the movie starting with 3 is that they got better and better and better with each film and Mission Impossible Rogue Nation did a very good job of continuing that streak. There was a lot of great moments in there, and uh, we get we, which led into Mission Impossible Fallout, which is easily the best film in the series. I mean, you have all the char you have all the same characters we've talked about before: Bing Rhames, Simon Pegg, Rebecca Ferguson. They bring in Vanessa Kirby playing the white the um who is she the white the White Widow, and like that was a great addition to that series. She was a ton of fun in that movie, and I as in it was just it's just. A ton of great action all around. There was a lot of great callbacks to the other films in the series, and 
it's a really, really damn good movie. Like, and the stunt work gets better and better and better. And that's the one thing you got to give this movie credit for. Tom Hanks. Uh, Tom Hanks. <laughs> this movie would be completely different if Tom Hanks was in it. But um, Tom Cruise and his commitment to more practical stunt work. I mean, the guy puts his all into these, and you could definitely tell that he has a passion for this. And that build up with every film getting better after starting with three and keep going after that you expect this one to be kind of on that same pathway especially with the same people on board for this but um i, I went into this movie the high expectation was there the critics really liked it it was at 97 on rotten tomatoes i mean it was a strong it's got an a cinema score everybody seemed like it was so it was like a big big it was like it was just as good as before it's even better like everyone was really excited for it so i went in there I was really excited to check it out, and by the time I came out of it, I will say this, though. It's good, It's good, not great. I don't hate it. I really like it, but at the same time, I have to admit that it's probably the lesser of the Mission Impossible movies. I'd say we're coming up around maybe around Mission Impossible 3, for, at least in my opinion, for this particular film. And um, I'm going to explain why in this particular sense. So let's start off with the things that I have that are kind of against the movie. Um, I gotta say, the first half of the movie started off really, really slow. There wasn't really a whole lot of... In fact, there wasn't really a whole lot there that really got me excited. Like, like I didn't th there weren't that many good action sequences in the first part of the film. Um, even though most of the action sequences are here are very good. Also, there's too much dialogue where... Everybody is completing each other's sentences, and it was like you, you notice it right from the get-go. They have a big scene early on at the is at the uh, I think it's at the U.S. Intelligence Committee where you have all these different people, and they're talking, and they all finish. Each, they all are talking, and then the other one follows up what they're saying. It's like they rehearsed this beforehand, and everybody was just like, "We, we got to finish each other's sentences here." Everybody finishes each other's sentences. You see um, Rob Delaney from, uh, you see uh, Peter from Deadpool 2, uh, Indira Varma from Game of Thrones, Mark Gaddis, uh, Par Charles Parnell. Um, you have um, uh, Henry Cerny returning as Eugene Kittredge from the first movie, which I liked, I liked his role in this film. He wasn't just a throwaway character in this particular mo movie. He actually does have some sort of role in this film and that we'll talk about in a little bit here, but... I don't know. For me, the op the first half of the movie where everybody was just talking and again finishing each other's sentences, it happens way too often in this movie. Like if it happened maybe for a little bit during the movie, it's during the first half here, I wouldn't have been bothered by it so much. But the fact that it happens not once but twice, we have these characters finishing each other's sentences. Multiple. It's actually more than that. Maybe like three or four times throughout the course of the movie. It's just like, like what's the point of that? Like what is real? Is like. I understand that you have to get the information out there, but you can't just have... But, like, literally, somebody says a sentence, then somebody else says a sentence, then somebody else says a sentence, and they... It's like I said, it feels like they've rehearsed this before they went before they went into this, and the, it's like they all had a meeting and said, okay, when I get to this point, that's when you come in, and then when I get to the... And when you get to this point, that's when you come in, and yada, 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 and it's just like... It happens throughout the course of the movie, and honestly, that's one of the things that is early on that really got to me a little bit here. But um, like I said, like I said, it's nothing. To, nothing in this movie was bad. Bad. It's just like it got a it got a little bit annoying pretty quickly. The fact that everybody was finishing each other's sentences, like like what was the point of that? Like um, and even Carrie Elway's in this movie, who I thought was pretty good as the director of national intelligence. He has a, he's, he has a couple of good scenes there. He's actually using a pretty good American accent, which is actually pretty good on his part, but, um, his character seems kind of pointless in this movie. He doesn't really have a whole lot there to really do. Plus, they introduce so many different characters in this movie that you really, you really can't get a good investment on most of them. Like, you have, um, Palm Clem Clemente, who plays Mantis in Guardians of the Galaxy, who plays this assassin that works with Gabriel. She gets killed off at the end of the movie, and you won't, don't really know too much about him, except the fact that she works for Gabriel, and Gabriel apparently tries to kill is wants to kill her at some point right, because she knows that she's going to betray he's going to she's going to betray him and now let's talk about Gabriel because um they have Isai Morales playing that character which is interesting because Nicholas Holt from um X, from the X-Men movies Warm Bodies Jack the Giant Slayer the great really great actor and he was actually going to play Gabriel in this movie and my fr and um you know, Nicholas Cole gets a lot of has had a lot of opportunities to have big movie roles, and unfortunately, just 
things keep happening where he just can't get he just can't get a break. Like this is a guy that recent just recently was going to be cast as was within the running to be in Superman. I mean, he he was one of the front runners and he didn't get that. He's also been behind. He also had several other movies that he was supposed to get get involved in, but he ended up losing the battle on that front. Like he he had so many different roles that he was up for. James Bond he was up for at one point. Um, I think he was up for Twilight, I believe. Uh, there were some other ones, too, I can't remember off the top of my head. But this guy has is a really good actor, but he's just never gotten that chance to really branch out into a big blockbuster role, except for uh, playing Beast in the X-Men movies, where he's really good. He's actually one of the few things that are really strong over the course of those movies. And um, it's a shame, too, but on this part here, I'm glad they went with the guy they went with, which, which is Isai Morales. Now... Uh, some of you may not know who Isai Morales is if you're, too, if you're a little too young, if you're too young, but um, you've seen him in a lot of stuff. Uh, Bad Boys, he was in the one with, not the Will Smith one, he was in the original one with Sean Penn. Uh, he was also in La Bamba with Luke Diamond Phillips. He was also on uh, NYPD Blue. He was also on Ozark. He was Deathstroke on Titans. I mean, he's been a prolific actor for so many years, and I was really surprised when they casted him. I thought, Isai Morales, really? That guy's been around for a long, long time. I didn't think that... Like, how do you get a seasoned actor like him to replace somebody as young as Nicholas Holt? And when you see him in the movie, he kind of fits the role that you, you have him set for. Like, he plays this, he plays the antagonist of the movie, and he's really, really good in the film. Like, he really does leave a lasting impact on the movie, and he is, he's a really good, he's really good in this movie. He's actually one of the stronger elements of the film. I really liked his character a lot. I liked how... So, like, he didn't have a lot of emotion to him, but he didn't really need to because of what he is, which, that is a kind of another flaw that I'll get into in just a little bit, but, um, but yeah, I thought he was really good in the movie. I thought that was great, ca great choice on to get him instead of Nicholas Holt, because I don't think Nicholas Holt really would have played that role very well, honestly, but I did like what they brought to, I did like that they brought him in there, so I thought that was a really good choice on their part. I guess one of the other flaws that I have with the movie is that the fact that the villain here is basically an AI. I mean, it's the entity is an all-powerful AI system to rule the world, and man, talk about perfect timing, because of course, the writers and actors strike, the reason is the main sticking point of both of these strikes is the fact that the studios want to use more AI, and they want to use the act, want to use different actors' face with artificial intelligence for one day of filming, and that they'll never be able to work again, because the studios can just use them can just use those images, and that's one of the main sticking points of the strike right now. And judging by the fact that some of some other things involved, including what the head of, including what Bob Iger said, and um, yeah, there's a good chance that this strike ain't let end in this year. I'm just saying that right now. But um, but like I said, perfect timing on this movie to come out to say, basically use AI as the villain. Which come to think of it, Space Jam: A New Legacy tr did try to warn us about this two years ago, and. Um, but yeah, the one thing I didn't like about this was the fact that they're bringing a sci-fi element to Mission Impossible. Like, I get it. Like, like I get it. Mission Impossible. This is supposed to be a really campy movie. This is supposed to be more. Ca not. I will. Not. I. I take that back. It's not supposed to be a campy movie. But the, the comedy here is supposed to be more campier than the other movies. It's not Batman and Robin campier, but at the same time, it is. Is there is more of a sense of the humor involved in this, and you can definitely see as we get as the film moves along here and um i don't know i don't know the idea of bringing sci-fi into the mission impossible universe doesn't really make a whole lot of sense and i know some people are going to say well, well you defended it when mission when indiana jones did it indiana jones i think is benefits from the fact that it's not just using like old school it's like indiana jones doesn't have to get, stick specifically to like ancient artifacts and all that it's a it's a it's based off of a series of serials from the 1950s He's the inspiration for them were based off of serials from the 1950s. Where you can pretty much do whatever you want with them. That's why I don't have a problem with Indiana Jones tackling stuff like aliens and time travel and all that. Mission Impossible, though, is a little too excessive. I mean, like, you expect the sci-fi elements to be brought into something like Fast and the Furious. Not something like a Mission Impossible movie. Mission Impossible has stuff in this movie that is completely far-fetched. But at the same time, there is a, there is a little bit of a sense of realism on those fronts. But... I mean, you get the idea. I mean, you get the idea here. The idea of bringing sci-fi into this is a little bit. It's a little bit hard to co comprehend. If it's done well, then I'd be more than willing to accept it. And considering that this is a two-part film, I mean, we'll see what happens when the second film comes out. But um, 
but uh, overall, I thought the casting overall worked pretty well. Uh, before I even get to that, I should so, so talk about some of the other negatives I have here. Um, I will say for a 163-minute running time, this movie's almost two, over two and a half hours long, it does start to drag a little bit, especially early on when you really... The first half of the movie, I feel like, is the weakest part of the movie. I just didn't think that... I didn't think the whole... is There was a lot of good things about... Is a lot of strong things about it. I thought that Rebecca Ferguson's character in this movie was kind of pointless because early on they kind of teased that she di she dies early on, but then she's actually alive throughout the throughout, throughout a good course of the film, and then she dies again towards the end of the film, and it's just like like what was the point of even having her in here really if you're not even if you're just gonna have her have her in the settlement here like and and the the funny thing about Rebecca Ferguson is that whenever she's not in these Mission Impossible movies for the longest time. She was really underused. Like she's been in some movies where she's been absolutely lifeless, pointless. Like stuff like um, talking about stuff like um, the girl in the Dr the girl in the train, Men in Black International, The Greatest Showman. She's just there to the snowman. She's just there to be the sex appeal of the film, and that's pretty much it. There's nothing about her that really makes her unique as a character. It wasn't until something like Doctor Sleep or The Men Who Would Be King where they really where somebody realized that, oh, wait, this is an actual, this actually is a really good actress. Let's give her more to do. And, like, in this movie, it feels like she's really, ha she really does not have a whole lot to do here. Yeah, she helps fight in some of the scenes of this movie, but her character overall co does really nothing in this movie to really stand out in this film. Like, she really has no purpose in the film whatsoever. At least I thought it was, but, um, I will say, though, that towards the, th the third act of the movie, which I think is well done, there are elements in there where they t they, they kind of have to force stuff to happen so we can move the pl plot along. Like, Ving Rhames' character says, this is the last time you'll see me at this point on. And you think that, okay, he'll eventually come back once they complete the mission. He never comes back after that scene. It's just like, so, as I don't get what the, I don't get what the whole idea was on that front there because we never see him after that scene. Like, he, like he says that he's going to go somewhere where the entity can't, get, can't hack into a system and you never really see him again after... You don't really see him again after that, and it's just like, where the hell did he go? Like, what happened to him? Like, like you would have expected a little bit of a scene that towards the end where he comes back and sees everybody again or something like that, but but it just doesn't work that way. And then there's a point where uh, the thing where they create the mask so they can disguise themselves as people, it creates a mask for one of the other characters, but after that, uh, Benji basically tells them, yeah, the thing's broken, I don't know how to fix it, so you... And, and you know, in a way, it's kind of a cool, con it's kind of an interesting idea because now you have to have Tom Cruise coming in without his mask and all that, and he has to find a way to get inside there. I do like the way that that el that escalates. I'll get to that in just a second here, but I thought that whole idea of the mask of the machine creating the mask just not working all together really, excuse me, and like it felt like it was put in there because they needed to they needed to add a level of drama in this in this case. They needed to add something where it needed to be there so they can move the story along and try try to convince us that some, that even though really Tom Cruise I don't think really needed a mask on in the, in that case honestly but uh, Vanessa because basically what happens is that Haley Atwell's character has to be Vanessa Kirby's character of the White Widow and she has to wear the White Widow her face a face mask of her and like I said really it doesn't really matter when she it really doesn't matter that Tom Cruise doesn't have a mask on him him honestly so because of what happens in the case there but um i don't know i just thought that was a little bit of a pointless little thing they had in there oh the mask thing's broken so guess what ethan you're gonna have to go in there by yourself and and uh yeah that's just kind of um i thought it was kind of unnecessary to have that in there honestly uh like i said in terms of the casting i thought it was very well done i do like how ethan hunt that mission impossible 2 persona where he hit, was everything he was jesus christ of action here those that's gone now i love the fact that Ethan Hunt has to basically do stuff on the cuff, and not everything's going to work. There's a great scene where her, him and Haley Atwell's character, they're in this car, they're dealing with this car chase, and they go, is and they have to go into this car, this little Alfa Romeo, and they can't control the car. And it's it was really one of the funniest scenes in the movie where they're just trying to keep the car, keep the car, car from getting from the bad guys and all that. And then the fact that they all they were also handcuffed at the time. And it's actually a it's a pretty well done scene. I like elements like that. There's a great bit, there's a great bit where, towards the third act climax, Ethan is riding his motorcycle and he's waiting to get get on a, a way to get on the train. And he f ends up going up on top of a mountain. And, 
is that he has this look on his face like, what the hell, Benji? And like, like even he can't figure he can't figure it out right away. And I love that. I love that he's kind of a he has kind of this you know he's kind of a normal person. It kind of reminds me a little bit of John McClane from the first Die Hard movie. He has to think of this stuff on the cuff. And of course, that leads to the scene where he parachutes off the cliff because he has his um, he has his um, wingsuit that Benji gave him. And it's funny because when that scene happened, it's a cool scene. But at the same time, I was kind of expecting the road, like Wiley Coyote, like when Wiley Coyote comes off the mountain. I kept thinking to hear a, like he hits the ground. And then another thing I thought was going to happen, I thought would have been funny, is that he hits a Canadian geese, like a Family Guy. Like there's a Family Guy episode where Peter's jumping off the mountain. He's in the wingsuit. He feels like he's on top of the world. He's enjoying it all. And, and all of a sudden, he's just like, oh, no, Canadian geese. And the Canadian geese are like, get out of the way, eh? And he just hits him and just goes flying off the ground. <laughs> like that's my mind. Is That was my mindset thinking about those scenes in the in the movie. I thought that was what is. I thought that's in my mind, that probably is what should have happened. But in that reality... It's really probably a good thing that that does, that does not happen. But uh, anyway, the returning characters, like I said, I really liked seeing them back there. Ving Rhames, Simon Pegg, Rebecca Ferguson, uh, Vanessa Kirby. I like that they brought in other characters, too. Henry Cerny uh, coming back as Eugene Kittredge. I actually did like that it wasn't just a throwaway cameo that you saw in the trailers. Like He actually does play a role towards the end of the movie, and I like that they did that. They even cut, make callbacks to characters that died in the first movie. Vanessa Redgrave's character, um, Alana, uh, Vanessa Kirby's character, is the daughter of that character, and I like the way that they tied that back. I, I can't remember. I don't, not necessarily they tied it back in, but it, it was a nice reminder that they actually put her back in there. Uh, the new characters I thought were really good, too. I like Desai Morales in here. Uh, I like Shay Wiggum, who's playing this enforcer for the community for the community tasked with bringing in Ethan Hunt. And even the, is there were times in this movie when I thought that he's going to turn into a bad guy in this case, but he's just doing his job, honestly. And even though, and even his partner that he has, um, played by uh, Greg Tarson Davis, who I thought was pretty good in this film. Mm. Um, I did like the fact that he, I did like the fact that he was kind of the, it's like, he was kind of the real, the realistic, the, re the realistic person in that situation there. But I do like Shea Wiggum in this movie. I do like that he's basically doing his job, even though there were times that I thought he's going to turn rogue and do something crazy, like he's working for the entity and all that. But, you know, it's a great summer for some of these people in this movie. Shea Wiggum, he's in this movie, he's great in here. He plays uh, Gwen Stacy's father in Across the Spider-Verse, where he's fantastic. And even Palm Clemente, who plays the, the assassin worker with Gabriel, of course, is Mantis in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, a lot of good people in this movie having a really good summer in this. Okay, basically two, but still, that's um. But um, uh, Haley Atwell, I thought was great in the film. I did like the fact that she kind of has that same ident same mentality as Ethan Hunt in the movie. Like she's this badass, but at the same time, she's also she's also a, she's also seen as a normal person. Like has to deal with these situations off the cuff. Like she's not Peggy Carter from the from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This is a completely different character. And I like that. The, I like that they brought her in here in this case. Like you do feel for her character's situations in this movie, and like when she gets into these situations where she really has to think, where she has to really pay, has to really be centered in on what's going on, you really do get invested in that. I thought they did a great job of handling that. And you know, Haley Atwell's always been a great actress. And I, I know she kind of badmouthed the MCU recently, which. In some ways, she's kind of right on, like, some of the things that happen, especially in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. While it was cool to see her as Captain Carter in that, the way that she was just kind of killed off at that point was seen as kind of pointless, but, but, um, I thought, but I, in here, I thought she did a very good job. I, gla I, I am glad to see that she, she's a character that I want to see in the next movie. I'm really excited to see what she does in this next film, especially since she's now joining the, the IMF with these, with these guys, and I'm really excited to see where that goes. There was never any point in this movie where I felt like, okay, I'm really going to hate this movie. I think a lot of people are over-exaggerating this a bit. There was never really a point of that, but like I said, the first half does start off really slow. What I think really picks up is when we actually get to the Entity. and We have that scene where, you know, Ethan, Grace, and um, Ilsa are in the same area with Gabriel and then, and then the White Widow. And they have that comfort. They have that scene up there while we is when we have this realization that we're inside the entity, and it's a really cool scene. And I think that's really where the film really does pick up because everything after that, I think, really does build, ramp up to something incredible, to some great stuff and some great action sequences. Like the train going off the bridge, that's a great scene because you see Ethan and Grace 
going from car to car as the train is slowly but surely detaching from the cars, and they have to get off the train. And sometimes they, it's like they're like the first train they get through, they're in the kitchen, and you see all the hot oil and grease all over the place. They have to make sure they don't get burned and all that. And then the next scene, they're inside of a place where they have people sitting in tables, and when the train goes off, they, they go up in the air, and everything goes up in the air, and they have to struggle to get out of that one. And then the next one, it's the same, th it's just regular seats, but then there's a freaking piano that's ready to take their heads off, and it's an intense scene. Like, I saw that, and I thought to myself, oh my god, this is gonna, this, this is gonna suck, and it's just like, no, this is a, and, it, and by suck, I mean this is gonna suck for that character, because you get you, you legitimately get chills when that happens, like when that piano is just barely hanging on, and you're and you're just tell, hearing Ethan tell Grace, "You have to jump, you have to jump at this point." And then right as that piano goes, she jumps. It's just like your heart does stop at that point. It's just like, oh man, like the action sequences in this movie are really top notch. I mean, this that's what makes this movie stand out the best. And yeah, the practical stunts that they do in this movie are well done. I do like the fact that this movie feels like. You're in that place. Like, you're actually, you, in the beginning, you actually feel like you're in the Abu Dhabi desert, which is probably because they actually were there. Like, nothing in this movie seems like it's fake. Like, you could tell, for the most part, everything looked like it was happening right as it was ha happening. Now, I know this has a $290 million budget to it, which I kind of have my takes on how people should look at the box office results to this as we, we should look at other movies that had high budgets like this, Fast X, The Flash, Indiana Jones, but I'll delve into that into another video, but I gotta say, if they used the budget to go to these places and actually get these shots, it was more than worth it, man. This is a really, really good, amazing looking, so this is, these are amazing looking action sequences, and they were what were keeping me very invested in the movie. Like, you could definitely tell they put their, they were there, and they were putting their efforts into it. Although I will say, I did like how in the credits they had the, they had this, they had to put the t disclaimer in there. Like there's a scene in Rome where they're dri where they're driving the cars, the car chase in Rome, and they live, and they're like destroying all these out. They they're like destroying like these built these structures and all that. And there's literally a thing in the end credits where they basically have to point out to the audience, just so you know, we actually filmed some of these scenes in a in a studio in the hall. In London, England. So we don't want you to think that we actually destroyed these things. It's just like, was that really necessary to put in there? I mean, I think, I think any sensible person would look at that and say, you know what, you know what, that probably makes a whole lot of sense. That they is that is we probably don't need to tell them that somebody should have been in the studio and said, you know, guys, maybe we shouldn't tell them that. Maybe we shouldn't tell them that we need to, is that this was taken that this particular scene was shot. At a is at a studio. Like I think people do get the idea that, yeah, some of these shots have to be done in the studio. And I think we've seen enough behind the scenes footage to know that, yeah, this was probably done in a studio. I just thought that was weird that they added that in there, in the post in the credits. I did feel like the story overall was not the best part of the movie. But then again, this is a two part film, so it's natural at this point to expect that. You know, we've had uh, Fast X and Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, not to mention The Hunger Games. You know, we all, we've had these movies before. I think we've gotten a good idea that most of the action and most of the r intense moments of the film are gonna be aren't gonna be as good as the first half compared to what they'll be in the second half. And I definitely felt that in this movie. I don't think this is as bad as something like Fast X, where they're just if that movie is just a mess on so many levels. But it's nowhere near as great as or as perfect as what they did in Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I still think they did that the best. And in this case here, I thought it didn't work at first, but as the film went along and I really did get to more of an investment of it in the second half of the movie, I thought they were they did more than enough to really cement this as a decent as a good film overall. Even though the even though that there were times in this movie that did lag early on because they got to save the best stuff for the next movie and they're setting up everything for this next movie. And and I still felt it. I mean, I felt it was more than valid what they were doing here. It didn't feel like it didn't feel like Dune, where, yeah, you can you can get excited for everything that's going on there. But if there's no other movie that's following after that, if it, it's because remember, Dune's success had to depend on the box office success of that movie, and they were and that movie set itself up for several different things. That if the movie didn't do it well, they weren't going to make that movie, so it felt kind of pointless. But that movie did make money. That movie was a success, so eventually that did pan out here. And we knew that this was going to continue on to another film, so I thought what they did was okay. I felt it could have been a whole lot better. I felt like there could have been more to add it to this. Like, I really don't know 
is, but I do w want to see where they're going from here. I'm really curious to see where everything does pan out here. Like, where does it is like, what's the end result of this going to be? So I'm definitely very curious to see how that transpires here. Again, let's hope that this writer's actor strike doesn't go on too long, so we can actually get this movie next summer. But um, after what is going on on that front, I sincerely doubt it. But we will see. So in conclusion, um, I like I said, I really like Mission Impossible. I like Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning Part One. I didn't love it though. I know everybody's going, cr most people are going crazy for it. But honestly, I I came out a little bit. Is in some ways I came out a little bit disappointed, but never to the point where I said, "Wow, this movie is bad." No, this movie is a good movie. It's just not as great as the films that came before. Like I kind of had this thing set up for this one to be better than the last movie, considering that's where the direction was going. Starting with three, then four was great, then five was great, better than that, then six was better than that. Six still is the is the topper for me so far. Fallout Part One, uh, Fallout, no, Fallout is the best one of the Mission Impossible movies. This, I don't want to. It's, it's not a bad movie per se. It's definitely the weakest one since Mission Impossible Two. I probably put this somewhere between maybe in between three and Ghost Protocol because I thought is I don't it's, it's I mean like I said. It's still a good. It's still a really good movie, and st and I put it in the same caliber as Three and Ghost Protocol. It's still nowhere near as bad as Mission Impossible Two, which is still the low mark of the series. And like, if I had to rank them from top from bottom to top, I'd probably put Mission Impossible Two at the bottom, the first Mission Impossible, Mission Impossible Three, Dead Reckoning, Ghost Protocol, uh, Rogue Nation, and Fallout. That to me is where things stand right now, and we'll see what they do with the next film. Hopefully, they can turn it back around again. I do recommend checking this out on the big screen. I think you can see, I think you can definitely get a lot of appreciation for the action sequences in here on the big screen. I saw this on Cinemark XD. It's a great, that's, that was a great experience to see it on there, and I'd say do it this weekend because, of course, next week, the big competition with uh, Oppenheimer taking all the IMAX seats, which that movie is another movie that's probably going to be great to see on a big screen, like that, like a IMAX or Cinemark XD, but um, if you're going to go see this on the big screen, I'd say do it this weekend because this is probably your only real chance to see it on a big, big, big screen like that, but um, even if you see it on a the regular theater screen, that works too, but see this on the biggest screen you can so you can really truly appreciate the, the grandeur of these action sequences and these effects, stunt works, stunt scenes that they have here. Um, I don't know, I don't know, like to me, I wasn't as overly, I wasn't as overhyped. As, I won't even say overhyped. I wasn't as overblown by this movie as I think most people are. I think the 97% it's got on Rotten Tomatoes is a little bit is a little bit much. I do think it does drag early on where you don't really get a full 400% full appreciation of what they were trying to do here. But then again, I was going in with the expectations that this was going to top what they'd done in Fallout. And maybe that was my own fault for thinking that. Maybe that was my th way of thinking that maybe I, need, maybe I shouldn't have gone in on that front, but... Um, but uh, like I said, but like I said, man, there's nothing bad about this movie per se. It is still an overall really enjoyable film. I do recommend checking it out. I give it a good thumbs up. I wouldn't say, a good thumbs up. Um, I wouldn't say it's the best of the Mission Impossible movies by any means, but it's by no means one of the worst ones. It's still a really good, fun, entertaining film, and I think that you will go into it having a good time, knowing what you've known from previous films. Um, I just say don't go into it expecting something as something like we've gotten in the last couple of movies where it's gotten better and better with each film. That was probably my biggest mistake thinking about it coming into that one, but um but um yeah, I really enjoyed this film. I don't like it as much as everybody else does. I do think there are more flaws into it, but um the action sequences, the stunt work, the casting overall, the elements of comedy they throw in there, and a pretty good villain I think do carry it more than enough to really recommend it as a, as a film that you should see, especially you see it on the big the biggest screen you can. So like I said, I give it a strong thumbs up. I say definitely check it out. So, uh, so with that said, let me know your thoughts down below. Do you think I'm on the same path here? Do, uh, do you disagree with me on the fact that I don't think this is as good as some of the other movies? Uh, let me know your thoughts down below. I'd like to hear the conversation keep going. Um, of course, next week's the big battle. The, it's, it's a battle that's been forged into the into the annals of time for ever since they put these releases to. They, the studios announced that they were putting these out together. It's uh, Barbie and Oppenheimer going up against each other, and I will do my best to see both of those movies next week. It'll be the first double feature I've had in probably a long, long time. I don't think I've seen a double, uh, two movies on the same day since before the pandemic happened. 
And I was doing that regularly on a number of occasions, but um, this is the first time I think in a, almost three years that I'm going to be seeing two movies on the same day, or at least try to see them both on the same day. I will have a review for both of them next week in some way, shape, or form, so stay tuned for that. But um, like I said, uh, keep the conversation going. Uh, let me know your thoughts down below on the Mission Impo on this new Mission Impossible movie. Uh, hit the like and subscribe button if you like these videos, and check out some of the other videos I've done uh, from the talking about the movie series. Um, I also want to remind you that we, as always, that we are starting a new channel on the, Re the Reviewing Network Live. We have a full episode co preview coming up on August 6th, and then the full episode, the full series premieres on September the 3rd. We've already got some videos on there to give you kind of an idea of what that's going to be like, so go ahead and hit the channel the channel link on the co it's on the next page you'll see here, as well as our regular Reviewing Network channel. Like I said, hit the like and subscribe button if you like what you see. Uh, thank you guys for watching, and I will see you guys next week for Barbie and Oppenheimer. So with that said, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and until then, as always, take care.